Hey, everybody, and welcome to a significant Wild Ride with Steve-O. I'll be gosh dang darned if this week's guest isn't the single most culturally significant person alive today. I mean, it's Steve Wozniak. He invented the personal computer. That smartphone in your pocket is because of this man. And I am proud and honored to call Steve Wozniak a personal friend of mine. Not only was this episode significant, it was a lot of fun, and it came out smooth, just like my shave. And how do I get such a clean, smooth shave? I get it from Harry's. Yeah. And Harry's believes you should have the best, most comfortable, closest shave, and not have to pay a ton of money for it. So yeah, they make blades that stay sharp longer than the competition, and for a far more reasonable price. Plus, first-time customers get this best deal from the Wild Ride podcast, and here it is, okay? You're going to get a weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor. You're going to get a travel case to keep that razor safe in your bag. And you're going to get foaming shave gel. That's a $13 value. And the Wild Ride listeners get their best offer, which is you get all that starter kit for just three bucks. Jump on this, man, because you need this product. So it's harrys.com slash Stevo for that starter kit with everything I mentioned of a $13 value for just three bucks. Get to harrys.com slash Stevo and enjoy being smooth like me and this podcast. Liquid Death, I saw you advertise that on the show. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they're mad at plastic. And and uh, well it's uh, that that's the idea is it's death to plastic. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is so exciting. Mm. I, I'm very very excited about this. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Wozniak. Yeah. <laughs> so good to see, you, bro. Great to see you again. Yeah, always. Yeah, always great to see you. And I think that a lot of people would consider uh, us to be an unlikely uh, friendship. <laughs> not not people who know me. Right. Anybody. Okay. Anybody. And I love right. you. Right. Oh, I that. love you too. I, yeah. I, I, I love you so much. And uh, we met in 2009 when we were on Dancing with the Stars. I don't even remember years. I don't do years. <laughs> I don't do years. Sometime in the past. Okay. <laughs> Steve does years, days, months. He remembers yeah, dates oh, so well. Oh, I have well. friends that can remember, you know, every event at Apple, for example, right to the exact week and the day of what we did this on Wednesday. I don't know how they do it. And some people remember names and faces, but I have a disease called prosopagnosia. One in 50 people have it, and I can't recognize faces. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. What do I've, you recognize? Voices? Voices. I can recognize stories, things we did. I remember all that. And uh, just every face is kind of the same. Even Janet's, I make mistake both directions. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Face blindness. Yeah. I remember the time I was in Saudi Arabia and they had this mask on. You could only see the eyes, but I could tell it was Janet's eyes. So I squeezed her butt and it wasn't Janet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's great. I just uh, a joke. Just a joke. Yeah. <laughs> comedians, every comedian, you know, has to uh, kind of rules. Rules don't matter that much. Oh, to us. I, I love it. I, I love it. And um, Steve has a co-host blindness where he doesn't introduce me or Paul sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you've met Scott Randolph, and and this is the gorgeous Paul Brisky. It's a pleasure Hi. to meet you, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great to be here. I wish I, we could do this more often, man. Uh, man I mean, I watched your show and said, oh gosh. I want to be there, a place to tell, you know, interesting stories, a little out of the normal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I did, what an honor to be able to do this with you. I just learned that the reason why you were on Dancing with the Stars, where we met, was because of Mark Cuban. No. Oh, no. No. Um, Dina Katz. Okay. And her husband was into technology and suggested me, and she was one of the producers. I, there. Re I remember Dina Katz. And was she brought me on, and to this day, when she asked me to go on certain shows or events, I do it because uh, it's her. I like her very much. Yeah. And she was the one. Now, Mark Cuban, during Dancing with the Stars, I had so many injuries from moving my body in ways you've never moved it before. I had a broken toe. I couldn't feel for weeks. 
Ugh. and then finally got it, it they did an x-ray it was broken but everything hurt every single toe all the way up to your hips hurt that much trying this for so long and uh mark cuban at one point um i the, the paparazzi got onto i was wearing a cast on my foot for a while and he got onto it and he phoned and said he had a doctor who would help me out with advice i don't know what to do what not to do yeah i love but mark that was cuban. really nice i've met him a couple times yeah i think he's great he is great man i wish he were president but <laughs> yeah um and, and, and i think that one of the greatest moments of Dancing with the Stars history is you doing the worm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. We were in rehearsal and somebody said, "Oh, you could do the worm." What's the worm? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and so one of one of the technical guys, filmers, he tried to emulate it. Okay, and then I didn't practice it at all. I did not no idea how to do it. Maybe I practiced it one one or two times, you know, like for ten it, seconds. It was, it was. And I said, "Will I do it on the show?" <laughs> it couldn't have been better. It could not have been more a more entertaining moment. <laughs> Thank God I, you didn't I'm so practice. proud to be known for that. I don't care if they gave us a 10 total score, <laughs> you know, but, um, oh, no, that was, a, yeah, memorable moments. I love to be yeah. a part of them. I, and then I, you guys struck up a friendship on Dancing with the did. Stars. Like, Very much did. How yeah. did that kind of grow and start? I don't remember. Steve might have come and talked to me, and just say anybody who talks to me is a friend. I'm really shy. I don't meet many friends. But, no, I um, I don't know if you ever got. I went out for every one of the the 27 celebrities and professional dancers and i made little bags of gift little gift bags and i i'll tell you when you're rehearsing you don't have any spare time mm -hmm. drove around to to bookstore after bookstore after bookstore to always look for books that had little like factoid type books different different ones not every bag was the i same. remember and then i then i put in a sheet of two dollar bills strange to have them on sheets put in for everybody and i put in my metal business cards i have these with me and uh, put them in there. And then I, I typed a letter on a computer about what a great experience this was. And I put it in every bag for 27 others. But then for each of the 27, yourself included, I hand wrote in cursive a note as to why they were good people. Wow. Every <clears throat> single one of them. And the next season, I told Donnie Osmond about it. He said he was going to do it, but he never had the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's why that was a, that was But I was figured I'm going to get kicked off real soon. And I better get this <laughs> done because everybody gives gifts. And I'm going to be out of the loop. And that's why that's why I was rushing I, I, to do it. Wow! I but, think that's a dying art. Now, Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, you were one of the greatest discoveries in Dancing with the Stars. You know, of course, all the people and how the show was made. But uh, man, we were we had to go. I, I ride my Segway to the show. Oh yeah. And I and I, I passed by this Wood Ranch barbecue. They won't have them up in Northern California. That is still my favorite place. Janet and I will drive down south just to go to a Wood Ranch. Um, just I'm addicted to their. <laughs> I don't know their barbecue sauce. Wow, nice. Yeah. And then but you that was I, I associate that with Dancing with the Stars. I don't remember too much of the actual dancing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> the I remember in the Wood Ranch. That's what we got. Yeah, I mean it's a story I've told so many times, but I'll never forget how I I got I too got injured. My back was was hurt on Dancing with the Stars, and I told you on the set that I was thinking about getting a MacBook Air so that my backpack would be lighter because it was hurting my back. And when you heard that, right away you said, oh, cool, I'll go with you to the Apple store. In the Grove. Yeah, and you can use my 10% employee discount. Yeah. And I just thought that was so fantastically hilarious. I said, there is no way I'm gonna turn down an opportunity to go to the Apple store with the Waz and use his 10% discount. I, I helped a couple other dancers that wanted to get new phones or something, but I really saved the life of Jonathan Roberts or somebody. Um, he was one of the professional dancers. His phone went bad that day and he ran down to the um, uh, Sherman Oaks uh, Mall and he knocked on the Apple's door. We don't open for an hour. We don't open until 11. He says, I've got to get to the show. Uh, Steve Wozniak is on. They opened the door and got him his <laughs> wow, phone nice. repaired. Yeah, yeah that. <laughs> so glad for that. And and uh, the, and he got you the discount when you went to. He did, yeah. And it, it was the craziest experience because this Apple employee, Steve called it, called him over and he said, "Hey, my my friend here is going to buy this computer and use my discount." And this guy somehow didn't recognize Steve. Oh, that he said, could be. <laughs> he, 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 he We're getting, you know what? Forty years ago, I was thirty. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he looked at him and he said, "But are you an Apple employee?" And Steve cheerfully said, "Yeah." have an apple employee number it's one <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say it that way but he said what's your what's your employee number and i said one and i get a little shocked no what's your number 
one. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I go through that a lot of times for service. Uh, and and, and it remains so number one on your card. I still have an active card. It's and, an active. Yeah. I'm an employee. I get a little. I'm the only person who's had a salary every day since we started the company. And speaking of the 10% te discount, any employee of Apple, for any friend, relative, whatever, could always get a 10% discount on product back then. And I'll tell you a story that's not really known. I got a call one day in later days, and it was from Steve Jobs' job sister, the one that I knew that he grew up with, you know, not so, um, and she worked at a local community college, and her computer was going bad, it had been too many years, and she had asked Steve, her brother, for a 10% discount, and he wouldn't give, just a discount, and he wouldn't give it to her. <laughs> and so I bought her a computer, of course, but that was just um, shocking. Wow, you yeah. Know, some things that, how does a person ever do these things? And some people can do anything. I, I heard something that was really shocking. I was watching Pawn Stars, and somebody brought in a computer, the Pawn Stars, to Pawn. And it was the, like, uh, the version 2 or the original one from the 80s. And they were telling the story, and they said that you would go around to in Palo Alto and fix people's, you'd do house calls and fix people's actual computers. And I just thought I that was... I mean, I, I wouldn't I, think I had, in, in earlier days, much earlier days, oh my gosh, anybody called me, had a problem, I would go down and help them out. But that was when you could actually fix them. You actually knew every bit of code in there. You knew what was wrong, how to find it. Nowadays, it's just too much of a mess for a, a human to do very much, you know? Mm -hmm. How would you even find if your computer has malware? Millions of bytes of code, you can't find it. You know, even an expert can't really find and determine necessarily that you've got something's hurting you, so... That's is, how it is today. Is that just because of that's how technology has progressed, or is that yes. sort of by design that it's not? It's how it progressed because yeah. we could always add on. It, it, Moore's Law. We were, in, you know, when we started Apple, you could only put about 2,000 transistors, neurons, on a chip, and now you can put 60 billion on one chip for 25 cents manufacturing cost. Maybe, maybe with inflation, it's up to 50 cents. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's gotten way too complicated. I long all the time, Janet would tell you all the time for the the old school the old school ways and the old days uh you know when you actually own stuff too now what, what, now, now you can just rent it especially look at a car like a like a like a tesla they'll just totally take your world that you know and totally change it you can't find things and you can't operate them and if one little button you need to be able to get to something with your voice isn't working you can't get to that feature at all mm -hmm. until they take over it's been two months or something trying to get a button replaced one wow. little button on the steering wheel. Mm. That, this that, is un, the worst service of our lives, man. We would never buy another Tesla. Wow. But we have an electric car in order, but it's it's a newer one. 520 miles range. Tesla canceled their car, car that was going to be like that. And um, twenty and it charges at 350 kilowatt speed. Tesla, our Tesla only charges at 140 max. Mm -hmm. So it'll be much quicker charging on the road. But wow. We can drive all the way to L.A. in that car and no charge at all. And usually your hotel has something to charge. What company it. is that? The uh... Lucid. 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 New company. They have a showroom that we went to. We passed by on the street, and Janet saw it on the side. So we turned around and went in there and in the showroom in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And we were also by one that we saw from the outside in um, Scottsdale Fashion Mall. So wow. they're they they're opening up their showrooms, but it's going to it's costly to bring a new car like that to the market. It's yeah, it you is. know, yeah. it's still bit of an expensive car and they haven't made very many lucids yet you said uh if you want to do something with voice command and that is just it makes me so interested no they turned off the the user interface menu to do some things and the only way you can do it with is with voice but if the voice button's broken i've right. had it break on me once before and didn't right. take didn't take two months to get fixed but what it made me curious is to ask would you ever use uh, Alexa or Siri or you know like well, for fear that Alexa's they're... built into our new Lucid okay. and, we, and we can use our it has CarPlay Apple CarPlay and Android Auto so you can use your phone as your navigation and other things so, so you're not concerned about them listening in and uh, you know all of this uh... well actually yeah sort of concerned but I also uh, like Alexa in my home <laughs> okay. and we have for example I'll pull out my phone sometimes when we're driving home and I'll I'll call Alexa and I'll tap in and I'll drop into the, the Alexa in our kitchen. I'll start talking to the dogs and they you hear them yelping, <laughs> yelping, mommy and daddy are coming. <laughs> I, I just remember there was, it's, at some point, I think I might have bought, bought some product and and then I, I was setting it up and, and it asked me, I was prompted, do you want to use Alexa? And it said like, it it's going to record 
Yeah, I was like, I no, say you're no not to that. No, when I see those kind of warnings, you know. Yeah. And, and the iPhone is really good about telling you nowadays if something right. you're doing might get you into being observed, watched, shared, and getting known. I go know as much as I can on that, and I use, oh, I forget what they call it, that hide your IP address. It's oh, built. yeah, yeah, VPN. No. Yeah, VP, VPN's one thing. I even built my own, on a Raspberry Pi, I built my own um, open VPN, the best VPN there is, in my home on a real IP address that I have, real IP before. So when I'm overseas, I can even use my own VPN instead of others that wow. are known. Their, their server addresses are known. And, you know, the countries you're in that don't like you doing everything can spot those addresses and block them. Wow. So VPN, but VPN's one way, but no, Apple, I forget what they call it. Oh, my gosh, it's it's a little catchy two-word phrase kind of. But it means you're going, you're going with your IP address hidden from everything you do uh, okay. on the web. Okay. Yeah, Apple's gotten a lot better with privacy, and that's they that, stand for it. Yeah, they stand for it. Maybe it's just by accident that wound up where they, where they were, what they had. But I'm so glad for that. I want to be, uh, you know, what we share photos in our families and on on iCloud costs two dollars a month, right? You share photos with albums and other friends of the family and can be in on it, and and. And it's protected. It's private. Nobody can take the data, you know, and find out everything you're doing. So it's, but but uh, Facebook says, oh, Apple is so expensive. They can do that. Two dollars a month. Why don't you do it? Let us let us pay for privacy on mm -hmm. on Facebook. That's my biggest. Probably of all big tech, Facebook's number one that I don't like. I mean, you got to be in the social web, but I don't. So I I pretty much avoid all the social web. I mean, yeah. I had Facebook. I had Facebook for a lot of years. Never used it. And I wound up saying yes to everybody who wanted to be a friend. So I had 5,000 Facebook friends, all people I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then then for three months, I actually went and started looking at Facebook because I kind of like little videos of dogs. Being <laughs> dogs and dogs being saved by people. No, this is true. I spent an hour every night on uh, TikTok just waiting for that. Oh, nice. Just to, to see that. And, um, and, and then I found that whenever I was at an airport, I was flying a lot back then, like 200 flights a year, I'd just be, find myself scrolling through. And I said, if I have solitaire, I don't need this because it became so habit forming after three months. Yeah. And I don't like habits because that's addiction. Yeah. That's addiction. And I want to be, I think for myself and choose what I'm going to do. So I, I totally, we dropped Facebook, Janet and I just dropped our accounts, deactivated them, didn't quite drop them. So I'm still scared a bit. Took, had to take Facebook off my devices because I read how it can still grab data and right. report to Facebook even when you're not using it. Right. I, uh, I, don't, I don't believe this is right because you should have it honest that every person who uses it knows what they're doing. Like Steve would post something and I would click like. You know, I'm, I'm laughing. I'd click like. It's from me to Steve. Wait a minute. No, it's not to Steve. He doesn't ever see it. It's from me to 100 advertisers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, learning wow. things about me. Learning things <clears throat> about me. And that is just shocking because that's not how we think of it. We think like is a way that I can actually... Yeah. indicate what I like and not that it's being used to advertise to me and uh, if you're a creative person as some of us are you don't want people to know what you're going to say next what you're going to do next where you're going to shop what you're going to buy when we should when we should give you this alert and all the time I notice that uh, sometimes devices that sort of guess on me guess you know you'll want to do this now no today I'm, I've got something else going on you know or, or traffic is not this way today because it's it's a midweek holiday mm -hmm. it's, and and they just algorithms just don't know what a dumbest human knows and driving a Tesla will teach you that we drive we've <coughs> driven the Tesla for a long time lots of long road trips we've taken at least eight three thousand mile round trips to Kansas and back and many to um, Yellowstone and back and we've gone up to Canada we just love driving all the time during during 2020 COVID restrictions mm -hmm. stay at home we just got in our car it's an extension of our home and we drove to every corner of California and back the same day you know way up 10 hours up to Eureka and, and 10 hours back wow the Mendocino forest oh redwood forest never ever forget it and we went to all the national parks in california and saw the biggest trees in the world and all that you know so yeah. that was that was really a great little escape but um the tesla when it's navigating it just makes if you ever put on turn on its features well anything actually just cruise control the number of times we've been on an interstate we, we drive 10 40 70 and 80 all the time and then we're on interstate and all of a sudden we're going 75 miles an hour and the, all of a sudden the car screeches the brakes the dogs get thrown forward and it slows down if there's nobody in the rearview mirror that we have to speed up for i let it go all the way down go down 25 miles an hour on an interstate a tesla with nothing around no cars around no nothing sometimes there is a car around you say that must have been it but sometimes with nothing around 
this is so dangerous. It's happened to us a hundred times, wow. at least because we drive so much. And then if you turn on the steering, where it's steering, my gosh, sometimes it kind of goes over the line a little and there's a truck right there or if a truck kind of moves towards you a little, you should a human driver would just pull away a, a few inches. And it doesn't do that. And I remember recently, just recently, once, it, I'm driving along and all of a sudden there's a semi on my right. The car lurched towards the semi and I had to quickly grab control. Wow. I mean, that would have been death. I, this is just horrible, horrible, assuming that these algorithms can do what a dumbest human could do. Okay, you're on a freeway and there's a big, there's, and there's there's a, a merger lane coming in. Well, Tesla starts driving, it, the lane gets wider where it is on the lines and it starts driving like a drunk person. But the car coming up ahead, as a smart human, you would just see we're going to we're going to be equal, so I'll, I'll back off a little. Mm -hmm. Just easy to do. Tesla gets lets you go right up next to it and it screeches the brake on to get out of the way, mm. you know, because it has to by then. This is just not the way human beings ever think. And they used to make it sound like, oh, artificial intelligence will be like a human. We have <coughs> eyes. The Tesla has, has has cameras and it'll be able to do what a human does. And the trouble is, we don't know how the brain's wired. We do not know how the brain does that stuff. Um, I know because I was a psychology major, and uh, we don't even know that our memories are in the brain. Memory of this right, meeting okay. here? Don't know that's in the brain. I, I took all the strongest subjects in memory and psychology and read every book I could and went walking on the streets of Berkeley and buying more books from the older days. And where's memory? The best they had was it must be everywhere because you take any part of the brain out and no memory gets lost from the rat. So it must be everywhere. Wow. What, I love what are, that. But now I came up with something 40 years ago. I have to go back. Well, 1981, whatever that was, 40 years uh -huh. ago. Um, I, I came up with a statement to, to make fun of the fact that the books don't know anything. I said the strongest correlation you can come up with is that between the ages of 6 and 10, as we had learned, you lose two things. Your childhood autobiographic memories, things that you've done as a child, and you lose your teeth. Right. <laughs> And that's the strongest, best correlation. Now it's 2022 or something, one of these years, 2021. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't do years. But you can look up, you, you can search for teeth, memory. You're going to be shocked what you find today. So Not to mention Alzheimer's tests in the saliva and <coughs> the gums. So you're saying maybe your childhood memories are in your well, baby I, teeth? Well, I was saying there's no way memories are stored in teeth. Okay. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But if I, saying that for but years. I have a stronger, more logical, mathematical explanation of where memories could be than you'll find in any book. Right. I, was make, I was just trying I to see. point out how weak the books were. Nobody listened to me, of course. I wrote it up for the professor, but... Do you, I, oh, sorry, Steve. Well, I was just like, it, it reminds me of uh, the, the thing that I came up with, which, which is that uh, my, my theory that the, the brain does not generate consciousness. The brain is not a transmitter of consciousness, but rather it's a receiver. And, and so I, I have this, uh, this metaphor, this analogy to, to describe what, what I'm saying is that um, we're, we're like a, a radio, kind of. A lot, you know? of people, a lot of people want to hear that. And, you know, all the knowledge of the world is in waves. But you know what? I just, I just disown anything that says we can have between people, you know, some psychic connection through the air. I always disown it. All right. Okay. Telepathy? Yeah, you, you don't think telepathy is possible? Correct. Like, like the men who stare Not at goats real. is all bullshit. Probably. I don't know that one, but I just I just think that uh, you know like 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 it, it, you can take your your body like uh, kill the body, but but you're not killing the consciousness. You yeah, know, I, like I, I don't buy that. Okay, but well, then there but you I go. accept you. You have a good you have a good thinking. If you start with that as your assumption, yes, you can come up with yes. There's something out there. I can't disprove it. Right. So you're just as good as your thinking just as good right. as mine. Mine just always wanted, you know, mathematical scientific proofs you can hook a circuit together and see a light well, turn I, on. I love that too. <laughs> I love that too. And and you said that you you love dog videos and I, I got a message and, and from any animal you. really. Yeah, I'm, me too. I got a message from you when I posted a dog video after I found Wendy in the streets of Peru. I got a message from you that you loved the video that uh that i posted about finding wendy absolutely yeah i remember yeah. i was in a country once and this dog at the airport came up and i i treated it nicely i don't think i had any food and wanted to follow me to the car and i felt it wanted me and I, I, so when i left the, for a few days later from that trip i just wanted to go at the airport and find that dog again and somebody somebody in that country had said that they would harbor it harbor the dog 
and uh, keep it for me, quarantine it, and get it shipped to me. But never ran into that dog again. I just fall in love with dogs so easily. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. You were talking earlier about uh, Steve Jobs' sister, and you knew her from growing up. So you and Steve were like friends as Patty, kids? Patty, but or? he kind of disowned that whole family. Is it getting a little bit hot in here, or is this story about to be totally intense? Woo! Now, in other intense news, I got to tell you, we've been doing crazy numbers with our merchandise operation. And if you aren't in the e-commerce game, I dare say you are blowing it. Now, what's the secret to our success with my merchandising? It's called ShipStation. All right. What is ShipStation? It's one easy to use interface which integrates every different selling platform amazon etsy your website you name it any way you're selling it you can sell it with shipstation and they're going to give you the best rates on all of the carriers like ups post office the dhl come on i mean it's shipping time baby and if you want to get a free 60-day trial of no hassle easy to use shipping just go to shipstation.com in the top right hand corner there's a microphone just like this one you're gonna click that and then boom type in the promo code steve and get off to the races figuring out how easy shipping can be and i'm not kidding about shipping a lot of stuff like this insane boom box with the microphone it's a traveling pa system baby and we're shipping them with ship station so one more time go to shipstation.com click the microphone in the top right hand corner use the promo code stevo and you are off to the races with 60 days of totally free hassle-free use of ship station it's time to come up in the world now let's get into this story Got you. As far as I could tell, I mean, they, they were a nice family as far as I could tell, just sure. like any other family. Uh -huh. I didn't even know he was adopted. Oh, so he was adopted, never, but I you guys grew up him. together? I never knew he all the way up to starting Apple and way in, late in Apple when there uh -huh. were some reports about it. He found his father. That's when I learned. Oh, wow. His, his natural father. He wanted to prove he came from real brilliant brains or something, mm. you know. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Brain smartness, school smartness. I don't buy into that a lot, like most people do. DNA smartness. I ah. think it's. Just, I think um, your experiences in life, accidents, you stumble into it. Every bit of walking around on the street is education. Sure. Everything you're doing in your life's education. Mm. You're learning to have good thoughts and think about them. If you are allowed to be creative, I, I really dislike the fact that uh, doing things outside of the main ways you're supposed to do things. That's why I talked about rules. I just hate that because you go to school and a kid might want to know what's in a drawer. No, you can't. There's 30 kids in a class. You start learning, learning that, oh, your parents, your teachers won't let you go off and wander in your own little directions. The best times of my life when I were young was doing, you know, pranks and playing around with my, my, my friends <laughs> and riding bikes and all that stuff. And, you know, stuff without school and right. even without parents. It was the best times, and I, I ran into a lot of the people that started these big tech companies or important people in Apple, and they always went back to all the pranks they played and the fun that they had as kids. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when you die, I remember reading once I was in the hall closet um, when I was about 20 years old. I was in the hallway in my house, and I was reading some article. I don't read any business articles, especially that back then. And it was about this guy, Sumner Redstone, who ran Viacom. And he was selling a $50 million company, but he had to catch an airplane real quick to some other city to buy another one. And he's doing all these huge amounts of money. And that was a lot back then. It's like 500000 now. And uh, I thought, would I want to be that guy when I die? And I don't know. I had just done some prank with some friends. and hmm. Or would I rather be the one that's laughing over what we, the fun we had in life? And I decided right then and there, life's about happiness, not accomplishment how happy you are, do the fun things in life, and live a fun life, and I have forever, just like uh, you and many like you. For sure. So, so that's the formula for happiness. Well, that's where I came up with it. I said, what is happiness? What is happiness? And I felt it from thinking about, you know, something we've done and laughing, laughing. That's a feeling. So it's the emotions of happiness. And so the good thing is smiles. Smiles is positive. I said, happiness equals smiles minus frowns frowns or when you get upset at things and I found out that you walk around if you get really entangled in believing something should be a certain way this is my way and not other other um, you, you're unhappy so I said don't ever argue 
You can have differences of opinion and be different in your thinking, but you both have good minds that came to the conclusion from you, from a perspective. So you both have good minds. And not and um, my father told me always be liked is the secret to going up in life. And and I always wanted to be liked, so I didn't want to argue <laughs> with people. Right. I never did. And but also other things that go wrong. Don't focus on the past. What went wrong? You know, at first you're mad, but then forget it. What do we do now to fix it? What's the next step? That's positive, constructive. You know, car gets dented. Don't try to blame somebody for denting your car. Go get it fixed. Right. Was it hard not to argue when there's when you're starting a company and there's creative differences? I mean, how did you learn? Because that must have been you had never in idea. my life. Never. I was extremely shy. I really wouldn't talk to people. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to have confrontation, which is arguments. And um, no, and we might have differences of opinion, but I would never ever take a strong "you're wrong." Never you're hmm. wrong. Almost Did, never, almost never. I mean, there's some extreme cases, maybe. Yeah, I heard but, something like you threatened to walk from Apple, something about the production of the Apple two or three or. Yeah, what they was wanted it? to. Phony uh, story. Phony story. And phony I know story. How it came about. Yes, we had a shareholders meeting. The Apple two, my Apple two, was all mine. Was all of the income of Apple for the first ten years of the company. What gave Apple the springboard to become what it is now? Okay, it was that product was important. It was bringing in millions of dollars a month. All the revenues of the company, we had a, we had just introduced the Macintosh. We had a shareholders meeting. All you heard, Macintosh, 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 Macintosh. They didn't mention the Apple II once. Okay, and so after the shareholders meeting, I, walked, I went back to the Apple II three building, nice triangle building on 280. And uh, the, the Apple, the, the great people that ran that division and the engineers on the Apple II side were just storming. They were just so mad. They were they were talking about ready to quit because they'd been so insulted by like being treated like they were nothing. That's how Jobs treated it. The Macintosh is everything, and Apple II they're bozos and and they were threatening to quit. Well, they don't have a voice that I have, so I called up John Scully. I kind of blamed him. I don't know what's coming from Jobs. I called up John Scully and I just read him. You know. The, the book from my perspective and these are good people and they're being forgotten and and that's just wrong and john john said well we mentioned apple II twice i don't know where it was it must have been some little double this, <laughs> yeah, and this and this footnote yeah and i hung up on him he was our ceo i hung up on him but i just did it so he'd know how we were feeling the others in in my division and after and then the wall street journal called and they got wind of this this um disagreement or whatever and I said, no, I'm leaving to start a new startup company to build the first universal remote control for TVs, VCRs, um, laser discs, which nobody in America had hardly. Um, there was only one hi-fi that had a remote control and I had it, a Bang & Olufsen. And I had a satellite dish that built myself, big, huge dish. There was no satellite subscriptions <laughs> yet. And so I had five controls. How do you produce them to one? So I started a company and I went on Blackboard and showed the Apple engineers in my division what I was planning to do. So they'd know that I wasn't undercutting Apple or doing something <laughs> Apple would want to do. Wrote me the nicest letter, kept me on the payroll even, kept me as an employee. But the Wall Street Journal called and they said, uh, you know, I told them what I was upset about at the shareholders meeting. And they, they wrote that that was why I was leaving. And I said, no, it's not why I'm leaving. I'm leaving to do this new project, a new startup. And they wrote it the other way. And Steve Jobs really believed that I was, uh, you know, against the company. And and but he, he didn't have the wherewithal <laughs> to see that I was still an employee. And it was really funny because after we were building that remote control, we had the plastic pieces. And well, we went to Frog Design to make the plastics. Frog Design was Apple's big design people that Steve Jobs liked a lot. And I said, you do projects for other companies? Yeah. So we had them design some possible remote control shapes. And then I heard the head of Frog Design talking to my partner, Joe Ennis, on the phone. And the head of Frog Design told how Steve Jobs came by on his bicycle one day. And, and the head of Frog Design, Hermit Esslinger, or whatever his name was, showed him, showed him the, the remote control and said, look what we're doing for your partner, Steve Wozniak. And Jobs threw it against a wall. He said, put it in a box and ship it to me. I own everything you do. Or Apple owns everything you do. I listened and heard those words. What human being, what decent human being could ever, ever do something that way? You know, I would never bring up a kid to be that way or encourage anyone else to, to be that kind of a person. Wow. Um, that, that was, that was, that's, you know, <coughs> you know, you, you run into, um, I don't know, narcissism. I'm in control of everything. Sure. Nobody, was he know? always that way? Like, cause you knew him when you guys, when did you guys first meet? First of all, the world knows about two Steve Jobses. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, one was ruthless, a lot of people did a lot of nasty things. 
but he was good to some people sure. that were important to him, good engineers and whatever. He was actually good and never did something like that directly to me, except a couple incidents. I just described one. Mm -hmm. um, and then he went away and he came back, Steve Jobs too, and he was a little more refined. Mm. And I don't even know if that's true because there were still some things going on that were very jobs. It's just somebody walks in an elevator and just what they're wearing, you're fired. That would still that would still happen. So, but I knew Steve Jobs zero for five years before Apple. We were friends. And he'd come into town every so often, see my latest invention, and turn it into money for both of us. Um, so that was uh, we had a good relationship, I and mean, we played pranks. We played in the world. We played pranks on each other. Um, we joked around. We um, the day I met him, he was 16 years old and had no albums. Okay, so I brought him to my house. I had every Bob Dylan album. And I let him read the liner notes and the interviews with Bob Dylan and then the lyrics to the songs, Desolation Row and songs like that. This became so important to us that his words had like life meaning. And so we, we followed up people that had Dylan memorabilia. We would drive long distances to meet with them. And, and then we would uh, go to concerts and everything, Dylan concerts. That was a big part of our life. So, but this is before Apple. Who you are in life gets formed it's called personality your personality isn't going to change ever neither is mine neither is yours, neither is yours. Right. when your your personality settles down between 18 and 23 years old college years and that's who you are going to be forever hmm. now Steve Jobs had always wanted a path to be somebody important <clears throat> in the world but he didn't have any academic background he's living on communes he's like with you know nothing kind of had me was about it mm -hmm. And uh, and so he and he wanted the path to be someone, and now all of a sudden with my Apple II, big money was willing to be put into it. And uh, Steve Jobs is now founder of a company. He didn't have a title really, just founder of a company that had big money. This was how he was going to spring into the world. You had to have a company. You had to make a lot of money. You had to become one of those important people. And he started just talking like all computer intelligence came from him. I just wanted to be an engineering away from other people. I didn't want to be near press. I just wanted to work on more designs. I kept design after design after design after design. I Andy did for wanted Apple. To, Andy wanted to share all of the schematics and how no, everything. Not from Apple, this company. When, when the money got put in, we had to incorporate, and I was forced to leave Hewlett Packard, where I had determined I would be an engineer for life. Engineers are good, politicians aren't. Management is politicians, mm -hmm. striving for different job positions and, and having to say bad things about people. And I couldn't do that, but I could do engineering. So um, um, what were you saying? That we well, I was just, because I, I, I learned this, that you had the, the Apple II was expandable with the eight slots. Oh, okay. And coming on, yes, coming on for designing the products. Um, they were all mine. The Apple One, Apple Two, nobody helped. I did all the hardware, all the software. When I look back to how much software I did, I look back now at my old designs, and I say, how could I ever have had the energy to do that? And how could I have come up with things that were so far out of the books? So far out of the books. Color. Um, our first logo was six colors. You might wonder why. And it's because the Apple II computer, I designed games for Atari like Breakout. A game would be a hundred chips and a thousand wires. And an engineer like me would have to keep track of every wire. It might take six months to make a new game prototype. <laughs> the Apple II computer was the first time ever that arcade games, it was, um, arcade games were being started by Atari right here in Los Gatos, California, where we are today. Um, and uh, I could go down there and learn to play games early. And Steve Jobs would be wiring up my design for Breakout. We delivered a working Breakout. But the Apple II computer was the first time ever that arcade games were color. Mm. And the first time ever they were software. A nine-year-old kid could write a good game for the day in one day. One day in basic. This was a change for gaming as much as for computers. That was a machine. And where it all came from was I was on the Atari floor, and I thought, man, it'll be neat if someday these games are in color. It would be beautiful. And then my head went back. I was an analog engineer. I was a television engineer, too. And I went back to how color is a sine wave on a wire that goes at a certain, the exact right speed, and it shows up as red. And if it's a little later in time, it's blue, you know, and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, I don't know, there's, there's books and books on mathematics, differential calculus to design these circuits, how all these, you know, ex existential waves and mathematics created color TV. There are books on it. And I just said, what if you took a little number out of a computer that's ones and zeros, right out of the computer memory, and you put it on a wire into the TV, if the ones and zeros got fed at the right rate, I knew every color TV would think it was color. 
never could any book have talked about that little simple simple approach uh, just a pixel in a certain spot shows up as green and a pixel in the next spot over shows up as red i mean um that was i mean that was you, that was kind of amazing but i just thought that way i don't know where these ideas came from one after another after another for about 10 years in my life and hmm. even before apple um, right. And you're, you're just, starting with the blue box. You're just laying in bed thinking about this, like, oh my god, I have no. to put this in the. Oh no, I didn't sleep for four days and nights doing breakout for Atari. <laughs> this was not possible even for me to do in four <laughs> days and nights. But I did. It. I did. Yeah. So your head, but if you're not sleepy, if you're if you're not getting to sleep, your head drifts off in weird tangents. You know, in between Psychosis. standing up, you might sleep a little bit, whatever it's called, and that's where this this color idea had popped in. Just I'm start thinking about it in my head and seeing the. The solution that wound up being, uh, you know, a huge part of Apple. And when you come up with these ideas, you want to share publicly with everybody, like what the idea is and how to replicate it. Not exactly. I was in a club of people, Stanford professors on down, all sorts of people that weren't rich and wealthy, but they're talking about if we ever had our own computers, it's getting close to the price with a microprocessor, we could afford our own computers. And they were trying to build kits that weren't even useful computers. They were something I'd built five years before. The matter of fact, right when I met Steve Jobs, I was building a computer my own design. And they were trying to do it the wrong way. And I wanted things that were human. Keyboard, a, a typewriter is human, a keyboard and a display. And I already learned that my TV could be a display for Pong you know, in games like that, Breakout. But I'd also then gone and made my TV a terminal. I made it so it could actually show lettered words and connect over the over the phone line to a thing, a new thing called the ARPANET. What is the ARPANET? Today it's the internet. Yeah. There were on that time there were only six computers on the ARPANET, started by the US government to put far away computers and I could dial a number in Palo Alto and then I could log onto the ARPANET and then I could see a list of six computers and I could pick one at MIT and go there and then it would say do you want to log in as a guest or as a as a user guest I didn't have accounts <laughs> and then I'd get on I could read files and I could play games like chess and this was a terminal I'd built and that was see, one step closer to the computer now in the club I finally found out what a microprocessor was I hadn't looked at them since the early ones which are too weak for me I like computers and this microprocessor I took home a data sheet Oh my gosh, the microprocessor is like all of the computers I designed in high school. One after another, after another, another, another. That's how I got so skilled and good at making them a few parts. And I said, oh my gosh, I know how to, I'm going to have my own computer now. Problem is I couldn't afford $400 for an Intel microprocessor. And then I found I could get one from Hewlett Packard where I worked for $40, a Motorola one. So I designed my whole thing on the drafting table for the Motorola processor. And basically I was taking that terminal, it could talk to a faraway computer and it could type back to my TV from MIT. I just put my own computer, the brains is the microprocessor, and the memory had to be dynamic memory. Everybody else was copying Intel data sheets. On a data sheet with, with lines on paper, you could only show microprocessor has address one going to address one on a chip, address two going to address two, you can only show straight wires. That's static RAM, cost four times as much. It was gonna make getting a useful computer 4K computer that could run a programming language out of the range of normal humans. No, I uh, put in the dynamograms one fourth as many chips. I always counted things by chips. And yes, what's what is a dynamic RAM compared to a static RAM? It forgets everything it knows. Every bit in the chip gets forgotten in two thousandth of a second. So you have to get in and supply some extra signals to make sure it it tr triggers basically every row or every column in the chip to make sure it, it reads and rewrites its own data every two thousandth of a second. And that takes some chips. But one of the things it takes is a counter that goes this row and then that row and that row and that row counter. I already had counters for horizontal and v vertical on the TV. I just reused them a second time. I always did everything I could to be clever tricks. Today you'd call it hacking. But mm. um, you know, I, <laughs> anyway, so anyway, I had the right device and I took it down. This was called um, it didn't have a name. There's no company. Steve Jobs was out of town. He didn't know it existed. So I took it to the Homebrew Computer Club and I passed out schematics to everyone in the club. Here's how you can build it. Here are the chips you use. Here's the code that I wrote for it. And um, everyone in the club, I passed it out, but everybody looking over my shoulders had seen computers of the past with all these switches and lights. Mm -hmm. And the computer of the future was the, the uh, this became the Apple One eventually. And from that point on, no computer was built without a keyboard and a video display. That was a turning point in history. But I didn't 
didn't own it. I'd given it away, public domain, because I wanted to start the revolution. These are the people that are going to start the revolution. Give them the, give them the tools to do it. And then Steve came into town, and it's the opposite of what a movie shows. Yeah, dude, the Waz is about to set the record straight about how history really happened. And I'm going to set the record straight about what's going to happen in my bedroom tonight with Lux. It's going to start out with me chewing up some delicious Blue Chew tablets, two of them to be precise. And it's going to end up about a half an hour later with me hard as a rock bringing Lux to Bone Town. Does that sound like a good time? You bet it does. You know why? Because it is a good time. And if you haven't tried this, man, I'm just saying you might want to because it is a lot of fun. And what is the Blue Chew tablet? If you don't know, it's a delicious chewable tablet with the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, except it costs just a fraction of the price. And for the listeners of the Wild Ride podcast, I can get you a entire month's supply absolutely for free if you go to bluechew.com and use the promo code Stevo. But wait, do you need a prescription for these tablets? You do, but you don't have to go to an awkward in-person visit to the doctor. Nope, you just go to bluechew.com and consult with one of their online medical providers. Couldn't be more quick and easy. Use the promo code Stevo, and boom, your tablets are on the way. An entire month's supply, absolutely for free. All you have to pay is five bucks for shipping. I'm telling you, it's going to make you harder than a computer geek listening to the rest of this podcast. Yeah, dude, blue chew, baby. Get on it, have fun, and now let's get back to it. There's a movie with Ashton Kutcher. Mm -hmm. Steve comes and finds me in a basement, a big geek, and he calls me to a club to show it off to real people. What a farce. He'd never been to the club. I'd been there every day since it started. I was a hero at the club. <laughs> I was a hero at the club, passing my stuff around, showing it off, and I uh, took him down to see the interest in it, you know, my TV and the, my board and keyboards and wiring and lots of stuff OSHA would not have liked. <laughs> Transformers with bare wires exposed. No. <laughs> but uh, took it down and he saw the interest in it. That's when he said we should start a company. And what he proposed was not a computer company. It was a company to make something he had understood from something he'd done before in his life. Make a PC board for $20. Then people can get chips from their employers, plug the chips in, and it's all soldered. It's all done. They don't have to hook wire to wire to wire to wire. That big mess. Instead of two weeks, they build it in one day. And we'll build the PC boards for $20, we'll sell them for 40 When you have no money, no bank accounts, no rich relatives, that's how you have to think. Mm -hmm. If what can we do today with what we have? And that was our start. And, uh, and it sprung, and it went further and further. Now, Hewlett Packard, I offered it to them first, the personal computer. I loved my company, and I wanted them to build it. But they turned me down five times. Yeah. Five times for the personal computer. They were just like, we just don't it, see a future there wouldn't have been a future if they'd done it crazy the reason is is they wouldn't have built a fun machine that could play games they would have built it back then hewlett packard only built machines that engineers used you know with dials and switches and power supplies and cables only for engineers mm. they would have built a boring dumb computer that engineers could have a little tiny black and white screen chiclets and they eventually started a program on my floor in the lab to do that and I had just built a device with microprocessor that they were using, with dynamic RAMs they were going to use. They had five guys assigned to writing the basic language. I'd written one all myself on mine, and they wouldn't let me on the project even. So they turned down the personal computer, and you built the first personal computer. The for first Apple. really well, the first really good. The Apple One was not, you know, very quickly was not going to be the substance of our of our life. Uh, we got a fifty thousand dollar order for PC boards with chips on them. We didn't have $50,000. We had to borrow 5,000 from a friend and we got the parts on 30 days credit, built the computers up, delivered them and got paid cash mm. in 10 days. Wow. And we had 30 days to pay for the parts. And that's what you do when you have no money. You just, I mean, Steve Jobs was a brilliant, brilliant at finding the ways that we could do something and make a step. And at this But that was before, that was the Apple One. Before we ever shipped the Apple One, we were secretly showing my apple II to people at back in atlantic city they had a show called pc 76 and we didn't want any of these other little startup companies to see what we had so we went down late at night when they were all gone and there was just one guy there with a projector i wanted to see if it works on a projection tv 
Was mm. that new? Is this is my color gonna my color output gonna work on a projection TV? And we hooked it up with that guy, and we did. And that guy had, was seeing all the things that young people were trying to bring to the world as computers. And he said, "This is the one I want." You and know, we always knew we were, that up. was the Apple II. So we were, and we were just showing off the Apple One. We hadn't shipped one yet, so we knew the Apple II was our our future for a big company. Wow, that was the one. The app because the Apple One wasn't designed as a Wozniak computer. It was a Wozniak terminal for the ARPANET, modified into a computer a little, but not really designed as a computer. At this point, when you're getting a fifty thousand dollar purchase order, are you guys are you guys Apple Inc. or are I'm you guys... working for Hewlett Packard and my salary is twenty five thousand. I got so scared. I had Hewlett Packard send a description of the personal computer to every one of their divisions and they all turned it down. But I mean are you are you when, when somebody's writing a check to you and Steve are they writing it to Apple Inc. or that's not even a company yet? They're just writing it to two guys that live in Palo Alto? Um, we weren't Inc. This was a partnership for that Apple One phase. Yeah. And uh, and people would just loan us money, I think, just to, <laughs> to Steve Wozniak or something. Yeah. Good friend from high school. Um, I, 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 we did have a name, Apple, Apple Computer, as a partnership. It's formed as a three-person partnership. A partnership partner who had 10% sold out after a few weeks. Is it, right that, is it right that it's a mystery to everybody why it's called Apple? Well, uh, Steve Jobs, one time I picked him up at the airport and we're driving down 101 or something and, and he said, I got a great name for the company, Apple Computer. My first response was, what about Apple Records? Well, they're a record company, we're a computer company. I said, that's all it takes? He said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because we lost hundreds of millions of dollars to the Beatles. Know, you got sued to the Beatles, Beatles. And then we got lost more huge money to the lawyers that we sued for losing the case. Um, but um, <laughs> no, but it was just such a great name. Who could ever turn that down? Those were the days you didn't need to have a technical name that said what your company does. You could be anybody. It was a fun, fun loving time. And on the last day of Dancing with the Stars, the finale, when we all came back, Long before before it was going to go on the air, I was sitting up. Almost nobody was there, and I was sitting up on the balcony right next to a doctor who had treated my horrible wound, which you didn't talk about, my hamstring wound. It huh. uh, cost me a week of practice. Um, and I sitting next to him, he said that his brother worked on that farm was up in Oregon with Steve. And it was his brother that went up to Steve and said, I got a great name for your company. Wow. No so way. that's the real far-off truth. Yeah. I don't know if that's ever told. And, but you believe that story. That's Oh, the, oh totally. Wow. Oh, totally. Somebody, n no reason to make anything up. And... There weren't that many people on that farm. Oh, yeah. Um, Scott said something that, never, that would I, never have occurred to me, but he thought that the Apple logo with the bite taken out of it represented uh, Eve biting the apple of the tree of knowledge. No, it's after, the forbidden after, fruit. after you have something you like, you kind of say, well, what, what are some things that we could say about it? Right, right, right. So I'm right. sure it's been said. But what happened was Mike Markle put in the big money to build a thousand computers for the Apple II. Yeah. He put up the money. He was a third equal partner. We had three equal partners. And he was the adult in the house. He told us how you form a company, who you hire, what their responsibilities are. He was the marketing guy at the time? He was he was into marketing, pushing marketing. Steve Jobs could never consider doing any engineering. He didn't really know engineering. He couldn't design things. He never knew what computer hardware software was, really. Mm -hmm. I could get into more stories about that. But So Steve followed into wanted to go in the marketing direction and the business and the speaking and learning how everybody operates in a company. But he didn't really have, there wasn't a title that he could have yet when we started the company. So Mike Markla put up the um, that that money and we were able to build a thousand Apple twos. We had some obstacles on the way, like Steve had found a place that squeezes motorcycle seats. You put some foam in, you squeeze it under pressure and it forms a nice motorcycle seat and that they could make a plastic case for the, uh, for the Apple two computer. And uh, we could get a few a week and they were just so loud. It wasn't like <laughs> normal plastic quality. We were, we barely, we had to survive for something like six months before we got real. ABS plastic from Hong Kong. Hmm. So somebody puts an order for a thousand Apple IIs. You're putting them together one by one, or at this time, do you have a team? Well, at that point in time, it was so early that our PC boards were still being made by a local company, and then they stuff the parts in, and they wave solder it. We don't plug the parts in. Then we drive down and pick them up. Same thing with the Apple One. We never really had a company in a garage. Yeah. All we did was we once once a week we'd pick up a bunch of pre-made. Apple One type boards. We'd bring them to the garage, test them, see what worked. I was the one who taught everyone, here's how you test them and here's how you fix them. And then they'd get driven to the store that paid cash. But we never had desks in the in a garage. 
We never had more than about one or two people in the garage. Uh, rarely ever used the garage, but it <laughs> represents the humility of our start, the sure. humbleness. We had nothing. You've got to use your home when you're young. If you look at the, the 10 first people that contributed to the design of the Apple II computer, seven of them went to the same high school. Hmm. That's just how it is. You go with your friends. Yeah. When you made that first computer, you knew right away, like, I just changed the world. Or was yes. it kind of like, this is fun for me? No, I knew it was so far ahead of what everyone else was trying. Yeah. And it was going to show the world a whole new way. I knew that. I didn't want to take any credit for it. Didn't want any money for it. Didn't want a company. Didn't want to start an industry necessarily, just discreetly among the others. And then the Apple II was really, knew that would be a big company, successful company. The Apple I was just quickly modified from a different product you know into into a computer but the uh, apple II was the big one like i said that was the, all the revenues of apple for the first 10 years of the right. company our only successful two, product yeah. we failed with the apple three we failed with the lisa we failed with the macintosh and in that moment could you have ever predicted something like the iphone where like it's all that power in a po in your pocket there were no cell phones yet Right. of any type not even analog cell phones and the amount of memory that would hold a song cost close to a million dollars <laughs> well, you think we're thinking of a, you'll have a little device in your hand with a thousand songs or a yeah. chip that holds 500 right. movies no Moore's Law says you'll get there right but you don't know when Moore's Law is going to end and you don't know the path that it's going to get what's there what's Moore's by. Law Moore's Law is, is what makes Silicon Valley Silicon Valley well, they started out building the transistor it's the electronic neuron and and everything you own in your life that's electronic uses transistors. Everything digital uses transistors. As I said, now they make one chip for, with 60 billion transistors on it for Apple. But they used to build one transistor at a time, not 60 billion at a time. And the inventor of the transistor moved to Mountain View, California, started Shockley Labs, hired a bunch of engineers, taught them how transistor mathematics would work the physics behind the, the parts, silicon and little other atoms in there. And then some of them left to start another transistor company called Fairchild. And the Fairchild had spinoffs eventually. And then somebody, I went to a show once when I was eight years old, and this guy held up a big, a, a, a pe um, big piece of cardboard with things like houses on it and streets connecting them. And he said, this is a chip we're going to make that'll have six transistors on one chip might have been Gordon Moore, you know, or Bob Noyce, this is the founders of Intel. And I'm, I, and I saw that, oh my gosh, I thought, now I'm going to have a better six transistor radio. But new technologies cost mm. too much for that, for people to really take advantage of. And, um, and Silicon Valley sort of grew because what led to the big economy boost of the world over, the, over some period of time, decades, was the rise in, in technical equipment, what it could do, what it could do. Because every year Moore's Law said you'd have more transistors on a chip for the same price. Every year you'd have more than before and just rose and rose and rose. And we didn't know how far it would go, but that's what got us here. Yeah, so is it Moore that it would like the, double or something? Moore was the guy putting the transistors on the chip? Um, he was a founder of Intel. And okay. he, he came up with this law after observing several, many years of it growing at a certain rate, how many transistors was like double the number of transistors every 18 months, something like that. Yeah. Got it. But does, where does it end for like even society well, it's now? It's still going on a little bit, but it's slowed down a lot because you get to, you get down to modifying one atom at a time. You can't go any further. We're down, you know, kind of close to that. So we're not really, um, you know, the only way to make chip, chip with more transistors is make a bigger chip now. You so, can't do it in the same size as well. We're just about at the, the end, the end, the end of, what Moore's Law brings us, but it's it's not really changing the sort of uh, iPhones we can make every year. But is it the metaverse is next? Metaverse <laughs> is is intriguing. Uh, I hate I hate in, I I'm not going to go to um, Facebook's metaverse, but there's metaverses, and it's kind of like what they call it, Second World, back when people could build their own properties and sell yeah. them for real cash and all that, and that'll happen. But I love um, the idea of. Of the, of the real geeks, the solid geeks, that just want to live 24 seven inside their goggles and deal with people that way. I mean, Ready Player One. Ready Player One. That's what, what I mean. Scott saying. says this to me every single day. He's like, I don't get it. I'm like, Ready Player One. It's, it's not for everybody maybe, but it's for well, the deep geeks that I was. I, I feel like, oh, go ahead. Steve. Are there gonna be music festivals in the metaverse? Yes, for there sure. are. Let me give you an example. Um, for virtual reality, you know, and I get in that, it's just, oh my God, it's so amazing. It's like you are there. Emotions tell you what products will succeed. But then I saw a live basketball game 
live. You know, and you, the players would go run in front of you and you'd be turning your head. I saw a football game that way. And you'd be under the basket and they'd dunk it right down top. Oh, the emotions. And then I saw Coldplay at a, at a concert in Chicago on VR. My gosh, and the camera's moving right around on the stage. You're, you're seeing so much more than just a concert that I'm for that, yeah. And I think concerts will be real, real plentiful in, um, in a metaverse. So here's a problem with the metaverse, bandwidth. How can we do it? You can put on goggles and be in, in an artificial reality and it looks really good, high resolution. But a high resolution camera is kind of narrow, narrow focus. You'd have to take 10 of those around right. your head and then you have to take 10 of them this way. That's 100 times the resolution just to get the resolution you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so maybe only do a hemisphere 50 times. We need a lot of resolution to make it look like it's a real world able to change that fast like it's real. I've you know done a, done a few demos like that and it's very impressive. So, so Moore's Law does have a, a little ways to go. Maybe. It's what? still we're still finding <laughs> tricks like instead of building transistors horizontal across this way, we're building them vertically and yeah. a little tricks that pack them in tighter. Yeah. I wanted to ask about music festivals in the metaverse because I wanted to hear you talk about your music festival. Yeah, the but, US Festival. Okay, I had all this wealth from Apple that I didn't ever want. I didn't seek it. And I could give enough away to museums that started up in San Jose and they named a street after me. But I'm just thinking, I, um, I had an airplane crash and after five weeks of amnesia where I wasn't forming memories, I came out of it and realized, oh my gosh, I haven't been forming memories. Nobody around me had, had realized that. So I called up Steve Jobs and said, this is the last chance in my life, 10 years after my third year of college, my last chance to go back for a year of college and finish it. And um, so my name was famous, so I went back to Berkeley under a fake name. Ro my diploma says Rocky Raccoon Clark. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you should laugh. Everything in life should have a fun element. I love it. And But around that time, I thought, my gosh, what could I do with all this wealth that, you know, would be interesting to me? And what music festivals had meant to me as an attendee in my life. Some huge ones in the Bay Area and ones in the Fillmore and... Uh, and then there was the, the movie Woodstock. If I'd read the book Barefoot in Babylon about how they put Woodstock together, if I'd read it two weeks before, I never would have invested a cent <laughs> yeah. in doing a festival. And I did the US Festival, and it was um, three great days. We planned it. We took care of everything, all the, the parking. We spent $10 million just grading an amphitheater that could fit 500,000 people. And it was successful from one point of view. If everyone liked it, I said, you know, however, however many porta potties is normal, twice as much. It was going to be, a, you know, a come off good for the, the attendees, but lost a lot of money. And then a big eight accounting firm said we lost money because of cheaters that were getting under fences. Mm. Yeah. So next year we, we made sure that it was tighter security. And this next year we would have photographs of the crowd to do count, you know, counting the number of people. Plus we'd have the ticket turnstile counts and we'd have the ticket stubs. We'd have three different how many were sold and we'd match them all up. And it turns out that the press was just wrong. They were exaggerating how many people were really there. But man, it was so wonderful. And it was really the uh, format that showed there's a huge interest. This was in the LA area, San Bernardino, a huge interest in uh, three day festivals. You just got to do it right, find the formula to make money. So right. now we've got, uh, you know, Bonnaroo came around, now sure. Coachella, and yeah. wow. Lollapalooza. When, when you had the plane crash, w would that have counted as a near death experience? No, the plane crash. We all we all survived. I I I'm the only one who didn't have a plane crash that was in the plane. Because I can remember everything that day from landing at um, Skyport Airport or whatever it was in um, in Scotts Valley, and I can remember going around and having to get around an obstacle, picking up two more passengers. Going for I can remember right up to reaching for the throttle, and after that you press it, and I had no memories of pressing the throttle. And when I studied psychology and memory, I found out that memories have to sit in your short-term memory for a little while to get made permanent. And if you get hit hard in a crash, airplane and car crashes, that um, very often the memories that hadn't sat there for 30 seconds are lost. They never get made. So I have no memories of an actual plane crash. And five weeks, five weeks had gone by. I wouldn't know it. I don't know any time what passed by. And... And I, I met somebody at Macintosh, somebody, I guess my wife took me down to the Macintosh group and my good friend Andy Hertzfeld said something about a plane crash. As soon as he said that, I said, oh, I'm in the plane crash dream. When you're in, the, in a dream, you can turn around and walk the other way. And I almost did it, almost did it. But I sat there and said, I'll play by the rules of the dream. 
I talked to him. Later that night, I asked my fiance, did I have a plane crash or was it a dream? Hmm. And she said, Steve, it was a dream because I joke so much. You know, I, I make up phony stories. Everybody, I had to know I had a plane crash, but I didn't. Wow. And so she said it was, it was a, a dream. And I felt my body in bed. I couldn't feel anything disturbed. I didn't feel where I was missing a tooth for five weeks. I didn't know my dog was in a kennel for five weeks. I would never, ever have done that. And then I woke up, and all of a sudden, half my brain was now forming memories and realized they had been stopped before that in the other half. Wow. That, that caught my interest quite a bit. And then I found 100 cards on the bedstand from all the closest people in my life that had sent me well-wishing after wow. a plane crash. I didn't know they were there, but I must have passed them every day and night getting in and out of bed. They were there, and I went, looked at them over and contacted some of the people. No, that was a... Uh, um, so that was a big deal, but I, I'm glad for the plane crash in the end because it got me to do the music festival. Right. I, I asked that because there, you, know, you hear stories about people who have near-death experiences, and when they come out of it, they uh, their priorities are, are sort of restructured. and you know, you Once just, in a while, but um, my personality didn't change. Right. And not only that, but they also talk about having seeing their life go by right, before right, them. Right. One of my psychology professors uh, at Berkeley, um, you know, was talked about his experience in the ocean, and he had gone under and saw his life experiences go by, and somehow they saved him. Yeah. But So that's that. So that's probably real. But how would I remember it? I might have <laughs> gone through it and remember had all my life flashing before me, but I can't remember it. Right. I, so. Um, right. So that was a uh, plane crash. I'm thankful it got me to Berkeley. It got me to my degree. You know, I have a huh. real degree, and I've been made wow, alumni of the he, year. Wow, the guy Raccoon guy has a degree. Yeah, yeah. Rocky Raccoon has a degree. <laughs> yeah. Prove I've been it. Alumni of the year, and they have like you know dozens of Nobel Prize winners on the staff there at Berkeley. Wow. So that was really precious to me. And I was engineering uh, alumni once of the year. So. I love that. Do you have a favorite prank? Like the no. coup de the coup de gras. No, so many pranks, unbelievable. And some <laughs> of the, the best box. ones were with Steve Jobs. It didn't quite come off, but we we did all the work to do them. Uh -huh. But they got disturbed. Hmm. Did you ever think about adding a prank inside one of the computers, like some kind of you know Easter many time, egg? Many times I played. I even taught um, computers to elementary and middle school kids for eight years. I taught them how to do pranks. I taught them even how to crack passwords of a computer. <laughs> you know, wow. and and it was a long process. You know, go down and you know set up. A, a password on your computer and then go change your password and see what parts what bytes in memory change find those and then start changing a b c d here on the thing and figure out what the scheme is and the scheme was just not even encryption it was just a cipher you know an a became an n and a b became a oh. q it was that simple so they'd go to school and, <laughs> and wow. get access <laughs> just by looking at the code you can find where the you password find where is it stored. is and then you find how to how to read it and what it what it is <coughs> or change it to something you want sure amazing but i mean a little bit a little bit of hacking but for good don't hurt anybody i have a question about like looking towards the future with technology because like to me with the metaverse it's fascinating it's exciting but it's sort of an extension of what we're already doing a little bit vr has existed it's kind of like it's video games it's entertainment but to me like do you have an opinion about like the neural link or things like this where like our brains would be connected uh, like through yeah, some you through see technology elon musk talking like about elon that. musk talks about it and stuff i haven't heard anything that's going to be important to people hmm. any of that kind of stuff neural links and and think certain thoughts and steer steer a car kind of so slow it can't really work into real life i I haven't bought into any of that. Um, in the few, everything that bothers me these days, I'm very negative, pessimistic okay. about technology, because so many things that I think I have, I don't own anymore, and they change. They change so drastically, I can't even operate them. Our Tesla out there is a good example. And then, oh, it would, I, I'd have a different way to it. They changed the way to it by voice. If the voice button on the steering wheel worked, but I've been waiting two months for service. No, I just hate, everything's called artificial intelligence. It's artificial, all right, but it's not intelligence like a brain. It's just figuring out a few little formulas. Okay, if you usually go um, buy some milk on Wednesday, it's Wednesday, we'll notify you to go buy some milk. Right, uh, right, right. So many times when it's not what you want to do that Wednesday, you're in a different city. You know, they're just they're just interruptions in your life, just like spam. And I right. really and a lot of the old school ways. I stick with old school email. I don't do the the social web and mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe and, it's because that's where I started. But and, and when you give somebody your card, it's your actual email. And of course. 
Email address. Of I made a rule when I was young. Remember when I was 20 oh, years right. old? One of the rules in my life about being was that these executives hide out, and they always say in articles, we couldn't get a hold of so-and-so to ask them a question about right. it. And I did not want to be um, that. I didn't want to be that person. I, so I said I'd always have a listed phone number, always in my life. And yeah. this is an extension of that, that, yeah, if I'm going to give out some data, it should be real. Truth is the highest to me. So here I've got four cards for, three cards for the three of you at oh, least. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Now, these cards have have 9-11 history. I don't know if you've heard it. But yeah, after 9-11, you'd get on an airplane. After 9-11, you'd get on an airplane, and they would, wouldn't give you a metal knife. They'd give you a plastic knife, and it would break off, cut and mm -hmm. steak, you know, which I liked. So I made these cards, and I'd go on the planes, and I would just slice those steaks so clean and smooth. <laughs> and the flight attendants would say, oh, a metal business card. It wasn't on a list like a knife. Right. But it sure served the purpose. <laughs> wow. It's and... It's uh, so cool. Thank you for this. I can't believe it. Yeah, and that's true. I, this is the third generation. Second generation was my favorite. I should have brought you some of those, but because I, I made a punched card like the old punch card days. Hollerith format, it's called. And I put my phone number on the punched card, and it was really boring on the punch card because my phone number's too boring. But, um, <laughs> but, but the trouble is nobody, I didn't print it, so nobody knew that's a phone number. You know? You, right. It'd be ancient. It's like when we had our dogs, uh, our dog litter in our house. We had six were born. And Janet numbered each one of them with nail polish, but she used the color of resistor color codes from the old electronic days. Okay. So a one is brown and a two ah. is red. So when the mother licks it off a lot, you sometimes can't read the letter, but you can see the color. Oh. Yeah, so we numbered our, our dogs because I wanted to know which one was born f before the others mm -hmm. because you see the movie Clueless? Yes. And where she says, <laughs> um, what's her name? Cle or I forget her. The, the actress? Yes. Alicia, Alicia Silverstone. Silverstone. No, but no, the, oh. the character. But I she says, she's her partner, Cleo or something like that. But she says, Chloe? okay, ask her when she was born. She says, well, I was born a month earlier. And as a, you know, more knowledgeable superior to you, I wanted to be always safe. What was the order? Because we had bought two dogs to start with, and we don't know which was born first. Mm. Wow. You know, I mean, life is, those are the important things in life. You know, not the all the business solutions and. You, right. What well, you're uh, the companies you're involved with now, are, isn't it like quite a few? And and a lot of that is to use business solutions to really help real world issues. It's not thought out that way. Business opportunities approach me maybe a dozen a day sometimes, at least one every day. Will you join me? Will you join our company? Will you be on our board of advisors? Whatever. They just want my name and. I, I'm only one person. I don't have a staff. I don't have, I don't have money. I gave that away a long time ago, and I just have to. It bothers me the ton of number of times I have to say no. And then they still come back at you, and you have to say no more and, and hide from them a little. Um, so, that's I get hit a lot. Once in a while, you know, I used to meet people more often. Maybe once a week, I'd go out to a lunch, and hear what they're up, and just say that really sounds good. And you, you know. I'm not a part of it. I don't want to get into anything new. I have a busy life. And then one time I sat down and they started talking about solid state disks. Do you all know what solid state disks yep. are? They're, they're chips and they're faster than the old hard disks that were made of atoms mm -hmm. spinning around. They use electrons in the solid state disks. And everybody was starting to talk about it. And this one company, they had, instead of building a solid state disk that you connect where it disconnects, they had a board that plugs right into the slots in the computer. You were getting about the eight slots in the Apple yeah. II. Plugs right into the slot in the computer and then has software that makes it perform like a disk. And because of that, you can write better software that makes it have more data and run faster than all these other approaches to disk drives that have to use a standard connector that goes at a certain standard speed. And this company had designed things the way I thought as a designer. When I designed stuff for Apple, and I was offered a chance to join them, and I said yes. That was Fusion I.O. They went big and successful as fast and, and important as Apple when they did. They changed the whole world. They were just starting, you know, you're starting out and a, you know, a one gigabyte solid state disk at first cost $20,000. Wow. You know, we're whooped to terabytes now for hundreds of dollars in solid state disk. One terabyte for 170 bucks today. I mean, um, so I, that was a great company. I was so glad to be a part of that because they were changing the world. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't really make a lot from it. The founders made, you know, a couple hundred million each, but then they each divorced their Mormon wives of Salt Lake City, and 
But I didn't think these Mormons with their tight families that I would have dinners with that would ever, you know, be <laughs> in that divorce category. So um, that was Fusion IO. Now, more recently, there was a group that approached me. And what they do is they look at ways you can make electricity costs more efficient. Go into a big company, a big uh, factory, and change lights and change air conditioners and, and do other things and make it use less electricity. And then they would collect a portion of the savings. But they would have to finance it themselves. They'd have to go in, mm. do all the installations of the materials. And they became, they were making tens and hundreds of millions of dollars a year for like six years. This is an ongoing successful company that has a formula. They're real people. And crypto was starting up. Uh -huh. And I talked to them for two years. It took them to talk me into joining them, as I liked what they did. But we, what we, what they made, they made it really interesting. We're going to have a crypto coin on an exchange. They wound up naming it Wazx, and it's on an exchange in Malta and a couple other places. Uh, and then people can buy in, and the blockchain tracks everything from turning on a light switch to all the costs involved in the savings, and you get part of the savings right in the blockchain. You as the investor in it, huh. and uh, it's called F Force. E F F O R C E, and I really love what uh, what it's what it's all about. It's all about energy efficiency. I was about that my whole life. Yeah. Right. And then we got the the space company, uh, started okay. by a really good friend of mine. That he always has business thinking so far beyond me, and thinking about all the sub markets and who you can approach for things and raising money. Uh, has done incredible with his last company, Ripcord. They're going to go public next year probably, you know, for a couple of trillion. I don't know. I sold but, an so, NFT at one point, and people were getting mad at me. They were barking at me about energy being wasted with the NFT. So is this energy saving solution? Well, even Bitcoin, you know, gold of all, it's only mathematical. No human can control Bitcoin and the amounts of it and anything. That's um, it takes a lot of a lot of energy to mine it to create to uh -huh. keep Bitcoin to keep these um, all the cyber currencies and NFTs going. Um, but it costs an amount of energy for whatever anything is worth. Right. Because the costs, the economy, three E's. The economy equals the energy used equals the emissions, meaning pollution. Okay? And that's a formula you'll never hear anywhere else. Sounds as easy as, as um, E equals MC squared for Einstein, right? Mm -hmm. It's that easy. The global economy, GNP, say, equals the amount of energy that was used. If you double one, you double the other. And that equals the amount of pollution that we get. Double the energy, you'll double the pollution. The only the only way to, to really solve this uh, climate problem is take our lives way, way back down in economy. Take them way back down. So I don't buy into a lot of, you know, people thinking, this, do this one little step, you know, buy an electric car or get a solar panel that it actually makes any difference at all. It can actually go the opposite way, just wow. like the Bitcoin mining. But, you know, everything we got in life, um, a house, a car, this RV is beautiful. Do you think the world's going towards crypto, or you think we'll always stick with fiat currency? It's hard to erase things that humans have learned and can put into books, methods of doing it. Some countries have even disallowed crypto and blockchain technologies. It can be used a lot. I think it's being used a lot these days to rip people off. Hmm. I'll start a crypto. I'll hire an engineer that knows how to create it, and I'll get a celebrity to back it up, you know, and we'll put out the um, the Kim coin, Kim Kardashian, or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's probably a bad example, but um, it's a great example. That's a great example. It is. <laughs> it's a really good one. Okay, because I don't do social web, so I don't really <laughs> know how, know the names to use. But we'll, we'll call, and I see that happening all the time. And then the founders that started it pull off some millions of dollars right away from investors that say, "I want to get in quick and early when it's young, because it's going to grow like Bitcoin. I'll make a billion out of out of pennies." And they jump in, and then it goes to zero. That's the common story. It's not the only story. There's some others that are, have made it for a while for some good reasons. Yeah, so I'm kind of NFTs fall into that category too. The number of people getting ripped off on crypto and NFTs is just, just outrageous. Now, Bitcoin is safe because it's the big elephant on the block. It's stable. Right. I like conservative, conservative thinking, you go for the big ones and they'll be around and... Um, yeah, Bitcoin is uh, so, so, so you, uh, stable. So I don't invest. You don't invest. I don't. I have never invested in stock in my life. I've never used Apple Stock app on the iPhone, <laughs> ever. Because why? It goes to my happiness formula. I found that my head gets to a peaceful spot where it's not worrying about everything being up and down, up and down, up and down like day traders. I had right. day traders around me, 
and I watch what they went through, and I just turn the other way. I don't read any financial papers. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want that to affect my life. So I never invest in stocks. Um, Bitcoin, I bought a bunch of Bitcoin at the start to say, how do you play with this new thing? How do you buy something online? And I conquered that. And how do you buy things in other countries? And how would you even pay for like a donut in another country? Mm -hmm. How can you find an ATM that works on your Bitcoin? And I wanted to experiment and learn it all. And then Bitcoin went way up. Well, I got scared and I sold all my Bitcoin except one Bitcoin. I had, that's not my purpose is to have enough to play with and experiment with, but not to make money on. And two times it's gone way up and made money. And just recently, I think Bitcoin is going to go to 100,000. I just, you know, I don't know where you get that feeling. I can't put any uh, mathematics to it. I just really feel it from all of the interest. Mm -hmm. The interest in crypto is so high. And so I put a, put a bunch of money into, uh, um, into an online wallet account, Coinbase. And pretty much it's sitting right where it was right now. It went way up, it right. doubled, and then it halved again. And But, you know... I think that's, I, but that's not my way in life. I'm just that's not important to me. When you had I, a ton of money, did your did you get less happy and then you gave it away and you never, got more happy or never I saw it in so many people. I never changed the way I was. I um gave my money to so many good things. They have a street named after me in San Jose. And then a friend, another a hacker friend, Kevin Mitnick. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's famous, he's got some great books. I write the forwards for him. And uh he was calling me like at two in the morning. I'm in Moscow, Russia. He called me at four in the morning. I'm in in Bogota, Colombia, and all these places. And I said, that's kind of intriguing that you get to all these places. Speaking, he was speaking. So he had we had a dinner in San Francisco with a speech agent from Boston, and she said she could get me speeches, you know. And I was ready to get a new new occupation. Oh, you know, rather than starting companies, I could always get involved in company startups. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And that's where it started, you know. Great. And and I went. I've done it for 15 years, and I've risen to the top. Nice. I have risen to the top. I got up to where I was doing 100 speeches a year, um, most of them foreign. Okay, that meant a lot of long airplane flights. I don't get to choose a nice set of cities like a rock group. We'll go all the cities <laughs> along California from north. No, I don't get to do that. It's where the speech offers come in. And uh, I've been to all the exotic countries, almost all the exotic countries. You know, the Saudi Arabias and Moscow's and China and um, all, a lot of, lot of strange places, some small places. Super cool. Can it's you, super uh, cool. And that's my occupation. And I've gotten so good at it. And I've been able to support my family. <laughs> Two questions. Great. Do you know how many countries you've been to? No. You've never counted? We made a list. I, sometimes for, we were trying to get a, um, buy a citizenship in Grenada. We got it. Took a year and a half of work. Figuring out what countries I've been in. Uh, in your in 10 years I don't remember how many it was like 80 countries maybe Ooh, you got <laughs> us good. maybe 100 uh, no right. we're, yeah. we're both sitting around 55 I'm at, fi I'm I'm at, 50, I'm at 50 he's at 55 I'm at every, 57 every continent well, yeah. well maybe it was only we, 57 we were gonna go to, I think you uh, reached out to me one time asking if I wanted to go to Antarctica with you to, that was the best trip of our life we love to we like to take <laughs> oh cruises God. we like to take cruises so we like to take cruises seaborne cruise ship will give us a cruise for a speech on on board mm -hmm. and we went to antarctica nothing, that was to drive to drive like hummers it. it was like a project or oh no the the, the 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 hummer one was um there's a guy that had a project a couple times he took land rovers and did trips driving around the world it was called okay driving, drive around the world.com d-a-t-v W and he went to all little countries. I've never been to Bhutan and places like that. You can't really get into. I mm. probably risk getting caught or something. Right. And so, so he wanted to do that and drive on this new road they built in Antarctica that would goes to the South Pole. Drive it, but getting all the support that you would need to you know be covered. That they would come out and rescue if you needed. Um, it never quite that one never came off. We right. Tried to get the science committees into it, but because Jan and I, I took, been there. Jan and I got on a cruise to Antarctica. Okay. Nothing like it. It's the best cruise in the world. Yeah. The best thing you could ever do. Yeah, you could have been good on that. And Buzz Aldrin was on that. Right, thing. right, right. We actually filmed some early scenes in modified Hummers. We we're going to modify. We got modified some Hummers with huge t type track wheels that can. Just, do just like Antarctica. the Apple Store. They made one elect electric, but you can't do that in Antarctica where you're going to get your electricity. Just like the Apple Store, there's no way I would have turned down an opportunity to drive Hummers through Antarctica with Steve Wozniak. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, well, eventually I got less favorable towards it because it was taking so long 
and they just were ideas and ideas, and I didn't want to be involved in the promotion much. And Buzz Aldrin also kind of dropped out of it. Right. And so it's probably not ever going to come off, but they did a lot of work, right. a lot of work in preparation from their studies of driving gas cars, you know, around right. the world trips, kind of huge, huge driving. Man. Can you uh, uh, talk about the box? Oh, yeah, let me see. Thank you, you very you, much. You, brought, you came in with this box. Yeah, yeah. Wait, let, let, let's hold it right there just so, so I can pee. I'm dying to pee so does, bad. Does anybody have to take a bathroom break? Do you want to pee? No, we can't stop now. Sit down. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got him. Like, you pee, I walk. <laughs> Alrighty, the box. Let's do the box. Okay. Lots of things in here. I'll put that down for now. First of all, there's there's a printer in this town of Los Gatos that makes these pads for me. Pads of two dollar bills. Are you they still real? Still smell the ink. Yeah, you can still smell the ink. They're freshly printed. They're not and, real, are they? Well, hold on. He gets the supplies from a higher quality printer and they meet the specs of the US government. These <laughs> bills and because they meet the specs of the US government, I've looked it up, they are legal tender. Wow. I've been spending them for like thirty years and um, I mean, I don't know if it's the right president. <laughs> for don't want to get ink on me, but um, no, it's great. And I sell a sheet of four two-dollar bills for five dollars everywhere I go. I sell lots of them, and because it don't cost me eight dollars for a sheet, and they're legal. The Secret Service has approved them. I've had the police called on me a number of times. The Secret Service approved these bills three <laughs> times. Two of the times they actually saw the bills. I don't know why it's only two of the times. And one time they read me my Miranda rights. And when they met, read me my Miranda rights, I should have brought it with me. I used um, a fake ID that I made from back when a personal computer could not print a photo. Could not print photo quality unless you owned a real expensive dye sublimation printer to make backstage passes and all. So I have this, I have this, the um, ID that I gave the Secret Service says Department of Defense, but I re-spelled it defiant so I could say it's a joke, <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a fraud card. And it says I'm a laser safety officer, and I have an eye patch in the picture. <laughs> laser safety officer. That's what I gave the Secret Service when they they knew these bills were good. They tested them with the pen. They'll pass the test. So you'll probably want these. I know Steve has them, but I'll leave a few sheets here. Oh my God! Oh look Thank at you. Cool. And if you look at the serial number of this top one here, it ends you know two six five. I did. It couldn't two, be six, more legit. Two six five. Two six five. Um, but they're the legal tender. The Secret Service is in charge of counterfeit money. Can I see one? Unreal. <laughs> can I show this on camera? Wow. Of course you I can. I mean, smell it. Everything I said is true, except the president. I know it is the right president. Um, and it's, ama it's amazing. Now, well. Yeah, looks great. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Unreal. My Game Boy. My Game Boy. <laughs> Now, they never sold this model in the United States. It's from the original, original Game Boys with the original, original Tetris cartridge. And this Game Boy lights up. It actually lights up. It was only sold in Japan. It was called Game Boy Light. And I still play Tetris on it regularly to just pass time when I want to. And one time, I used to have always have the high score on Game Boy Tetris and I'd send it into Nintendo Power Magazine back when you had to take real photos and send them in the paper mail and they said oh we, your name's always in there we want you we, we don't want to print it anymore we're not going to print your name anymore because we want new people to get on the list <laughs> oh so I, 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 did, I took a picture of a high score and I spelled my name Steve backwards is Evitz and Wozniak backwards is Kane Zhao Evitz Kane Zhao and then I thought <laughs> if I put Los Gatos they'll get suspicious it's the same guy so I put Saratoga, California, the next city over, and I sent it in, and then I forgot about it. And I picked up this Nintendo Power magazine um, one day, and I flipped back to where they have the scores, and it's in here, but it prints that name, Evitz Kainzow, and I saw it. I didn't know it was mine. I'd forgotten I'd done it. And I said, oh my God, a foreigner. And he said, Saratoga, I got chilled, he's nearby. <laughs> and then and then I remember doing it. But my, so my name backwards is actually in that magazine. So you're still ranked for your Tetris score. Yes. Wow. Well, it was it was the highest that was ever printed in Nintendo Power magazine. I don't play it anymore. Well, There's people what was so the much better score? than me, I'm sure. I don't know. Um, the highest one I ever got, I didn't send into them. It was in later years. I think it was six hundred and thirty thousand, something like that. And my goal was seven hundred fifty, but never, I'll never hit it. Now this is a great mask, of course. 
because everywhere I go, this is the number one mask. Everyone says, oh, I like your mask. I like your mask. You know, they never do that. Every <laughs> single so place you go. So on airplanes, I'd like to put this N95 over it. And then I'll, I'll <laughs> it's a little tight. I'll call a flight attendant and I'll say, I want to inform you that for the rest of this flight, I'm going to take this mask off. <laughs> and and at first they're shocked and kind of accusing me, you know, and then they laugh. <laughs> so laughter, laughter is really worth it, you know. Now I used to go into Janet and I for quite a while wore uh, this type of face mask. Hang on, it might be trapped. This type of face mask with a HEPA filter that you could wear. You could wear on the lanyard. That's great. See, so you'd wear it, you'd wear it, and you can turn it on to three blowing levels. Okay, yeah. so sometimes when we're going to the cigarette smoke or something, ja Janice Asthmetic, this is a nice way to get fresh air, mm -hmm. fresh air through a through a fan that's in here. And that when I go into the stores, like the grocery store, um, I would tell people a normal mask isn't adequate for my condition. And they'd say, what's your condition? I'd say, geekiness. <laughs> 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 this this mask I've worn a couple of times during the mask days with something under it and I love this mask. <laughs> but, wow. It's also for geekiness. Now I, we got another type of HEPA mask, HEPA filter mask, right here that just goes on you. And it's also uh, got yeah, a HEPA I filter. I bought those. Yeah, it's smaller and, and you got buttons for the like a the, Bane from Batman. Now, that one. during the, the Black Lives Matter protest, I thought if I ever heard of a protest around here, I might want to get in it. So I actually bought a real gas mask too, but I never used this in public to say this is my <laughs> this is my mask, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> that takes care of my box. Wow. That's so great. Yeah, that's fantastic. That I brought today. Box. Steve and I always joke about with the time we got dinner and uh, they came over with the pepper and he said, Course. And then when they're oh. done, you said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that once a week. That's amazing, because just last night, we went out to dinner with, I don't know, uh, oh, a friend, a friend from the Masons. I'm an honorary California Freemason for oh. life. Wow. I'm a life member. I, I'm not a Mason as a person. Is there a secret handshake? Not, but I went through a whole bunch of things because my wife at the time was an Eastern star, and then we could have more joint time together. Is there, is there, is there a secret word you have to learn that I have no idea what... The, I can you can never remember them. It's very difficult. And you go up three levels, you're a mason for life, and you, everyone goes up to thirty three levels. Not me. I dropped out because we got divorced. Yeah, and you, you probably played some tricks on them. Too. But we were at, we were at the the restaurant yesterday, the old spaghetti factory. They they brought out pepper, and I did the old the standard thing, or maybe it was the night before somewhere. And I said, of course. And then that's fine. <laughs> and whoever it was, it was, at, it was actually at the Grill on the Alley Steakhouse, it's and they so were good. they were actually kind of pleased with the, <laughs> the joke. <laughs> I'm it's sure. fantastic, and because I do like coarse pepper, you know. That's and fine. When I said of course, of course, she unscrewed it to make it coarse. She realized <laughs> great. She realized it was more than just saying, a, yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah, I, love it. So. I mean, I, I got to say that every time I've ever gotten together with you has just been the most fantastic experience. <laughs> I value our friendship beyond measure yes and i this i the same absolutely yeah. it's I, uh, i'm i'm a person that makes very very few friends in my life you know every two years i might make another one <clears throat> that'll be a long-term friend continually it's very rare yeah well I, I'm, you're, I'm, you're in there you're the one <laughs> i'm absolutely beyond grateful for you and yeah. uh and and this time like like always was very special and the fact that we were able to record it and share it with the world is even more so, so yeah. thank you. The key people in my life are creative people and also especially comedians, uh, magicians. And the, <laughs> and the fact that you came to my bucket list show and, and actually made it through to the end. I, I, I Oh no, no, I understand comedy. I was not against that. I was not disfavorable. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you do, that's your business. Oh right. no, no, I understood it. I told Julie that she, she said that you thought that somehow I was offended by it. No, no, I was just scared that you were gonna see the things that I show at my bucket list. <laughs> oh, you gave me some, no, we, we took out some really straight friends and I started describing exactly what you'd done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow, man, I, I love okay. you, Steve, and uh, thank you for this, really. Okay, love you, looking forward uh, to the next time. Oh, is there anything that we can promote for you? Do you want to send any traffic anywhere? I, I never do. I never try to promote I myself so. or anything. He's like, yeah. world peace. 
<laughs> yeah, world peace. I probably did uh, rescue oh. rescue a dog and world oh, peace. Oh, that mask. Where'd that face mask go? The uh, selfie mask. Um, maskalike.com makes the best ones. I don't get anything to them. Mask alike. Maskalike. Don't make a mask that looks like your face. That looks like your face. Uh -huh. You can also buy ones that look like dogs and stuff. Sure. I have some of those. I want a Steve Wozniak mask. Okay, that's upside that's down. It. Oh well, that would be a Steve Wozniak mask if it were right side up. <laughs> I get that. Maskalike.com. Yeah, yeah, I think a couple more are getting delivered to our house in a day or two. I love it. It's fantastic. It wears out. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I've only been wearing it for like three weeks. Good. But every every single place, people say, "Oh, I like your mask." Yeah. <laughs> well, you said it. Okay. Well, bless you, Steve, and and th thank you so much for this. Good. Yeah. So everybody, go to go get something at Maskalike.com. We've got to drive our dogs com. home now. Yeah. There you go. And there it is, folks. Can you even believe it, dude? I mean, he, he said he makes a friend every few years, and I'm one of his friends. And, dude, he sat there and talked with us for like an hour and 20 minutes, man. He, he, he came out to see my show on tour. He watched me ejaculate as I fell out of an airplane butt naked with a dude strapped to my back. And then he, he told me that he enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm beside myself. This dude really is the most, he's had the single most impact on the, the future of the human race out of anybody who's lived. God damn. Thank you for watching.